Welcome to Disrupting Japan. Straight talk from Japan's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for joining me. Today, we're going to talk about predicting future crime. And not in terms of 1950s science fiction, but in terms of real software being used right now by police departments all over the world. Today, we talk with Mami Kajita of Singular Perturbations about their Crime Nabi AI and how this technology is starting to change policing. In real world use, Crime Nabi has already resulted in crime reductions of over 50% in areas where it's been tested around the world. In our conversation, Mami and I dig into these numbers and we talk about the somewhat surprising inputs that go into training the Crime Nabi AI. And of course, we also talk about the very real potential dangers for misuse and what Singular Perturbations is doing to make sure this technology is a force for good. Along the way, we talk about how founders can find good mentors and advisors the proper balance between research and sales, and some really good advice about how to sell to national governments as a startup. But you know, Mommy tells that story much better than I can. So let's get right to the interview. So, okay. cheers. Cheers. Mm. So I'm sitting here with Mommy Kajita, the founder and CEO of Singular Perturbations, the AI for crime prediction. So thanks for sitting down with me. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here and thank you so much for this opportunity. <laughs> I'm glad to have you here. In the intro, I explained a little bit about what Singular Perturbations does, but I, I think you can explain it much better than me. Yeah. So what does Singular Perturbations do? We predict future crimes using AI technology, and uh, we provide operation management uh, services for police departments and local governments. And the name of our product is Crime Nabi. So you're telling police departments where future crime is likely to occur? Yes, yes. Uh, using this technology, we can provide the area where the risk is higher than the uh, other area. Okay, and how do they use this information? What do they do with it? We provide operation management services in the police department, and there is a team who patrols outside. And in Japan, uh, many uh, police departments doesn't use crime prediction technology before patrols. They have not so much uh, established plan. So the police departments are using this predictive technology to decide where to send patrols. Yes, yes. Okay. What kind of predictions does it make? Does it predict the type of crime or just the level or? Our crime prediction technology uh, predict future crimes when and where, which crime type is uh, likely to occur. Okay. Looking at your website though, you also have an app that individual citizens can download. Yeah, this uh, mobile uh, application have a users uh, of citizens. And in Japan, in local governments, they have a team who patrols outside using a blue patrol car. And we provide our uh, crime prediction mobile application for them. Ah, okay, so it's not individual citizens, it's still the government. Ah, uh, yes. It's just not police. It's not police department, but many of blue patrol cars are operated by local governments or citizens. So it's similar to, in America, we have Neighborhood Watch. Yes, it's Neighborhood Watch. It's yes. a similar program to that. Yes, yes. Okay. Let's dive deep into the technology, the business model, a little bit later. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and let's talk a little bit about, about you. Yes. So. You founded Singular Perturbations back in 2017. Yes. And back then you were a researcher at the University of Tokyo. Yes. So did it start out as a research project? How did you get the idea to start this? 
I have a background of theoretical physics. My, my uh, research topic is about glass transition. The topic is very different from the crime prediction technology. But I worked for university for several years, and after that I have to move to Italy because so my husband uh, have to move to Italy. So I uh, went with him. Yes, yes. At the time I quitted my research topic, and I was thinking about my future and. My research background is theoretical physics, but I think that theoretical physics is a very basic topic. And theoretical physics people have a potential to make in models. I've always thought so. I, I majored in physics myself, but I've always thought that physics is kind of the liberal arts of the sciences. Uh, yes, yes, yes. You, you understand a little bit of everything, but until you get a PhD, you're not really qualified to do anything in particular. Yeah. So the mathematics and the modeling for the glass transitions, mm -hmm. is it similar? Ah, uh, yes, very similar, yeah. Using this background, this kind of basic liberal arts background helps to create a new business. I think that there is a many similarity between researcher and entrepreneur. I think so too, and I want to talk about that, but I'm really curious, what is the connection between the physics of glass transition and crime prediction. Yes, it's yes. not an obvious yes. link. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Eight years ago, I started to live in Italy, in Bologna, and I have experiences to be pickpocketed several wow. times. And at the time, I wanted to start some new services using theoretical physics backgrounds. So I studied to develop mobile application, and I collected crime data and then I developed a mobile application which shows when and where the past crime occurred. And also I found a theoretical paper which is about crime prediction technology. And uh, this paper uh, was written uh, by a theoretical physicist. So I started to analyze the crime data using this kind of technology. And uh, then I invented a new algorithm to predict future crime and this achieved very good accuracy. Were you a researcher while you were living in Italy, or was this just a side project you were doing for fun? Ah, this is for fun. <laughs> okay, no, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, and after that, I sold this mobile application to a Japanese company, and then I wanted to start a new crime prediction project. So after you sold that mobile application company, what brought you back to Tokyo? How did you start this startup? After I came back to Japan, I entered the company where I sold my application and I tried to make a business using crime prediction, but it has several problems, so I founded my company by myself after that. At the time, I was only a visiting researcher at University of Tokyo and I met one policeman. He is very interested in my crime prediction technology, so he can invite me to a project of police department. This is interesting to me. So when you went to the University of Tokyo as a researcher, mm -hmm. were you going in thinking that, okay, I really want to start another company now? Or were you thinking, okay, I really want to get back to theoretical physics research? Uh, after I have experienced long time research, I was very devoted in that topic, but I also think that may maybe I can help some people, but the impact is not so big. But using my background, I can make more big impact using this kind of technology. That's why I was interested in the development of mobile application and the foundation of my company. I think that is one of the most exciting things and the most addictive things about startups. Mm -hmm. And many people discover it when they first start, um, how valuable what you make is to your customers mm -hmm. and how appreciative they are. And that's something you usually don't get in the business world or in, as a researcher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. So you're still doing fundamental research, and that was a, a Neto grant, right? I guess Neto grant, yes. So one of the things a lot of researchers struggle with is the pull between doing long-term fundamental research mm -hmm, yeah. and having to sell this much product this quarter to, to make sure you're on track to get your next funding round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you handle that, that conflict? Yes, 
At the first, when I found my company, we can only provide crime prediction report. But this type of report doesn't change the police department's operation. Yeah. So we want to change the operation. Well, let's talk about some of your successful trials and proof of concepts you've run so far. You launched a project in Adachiku in 2020 in Nagoya last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what were the results? Yeah, uh, Nagoya City introduced our product and many other local governments and the police departments started proof of concept. And now we started proof of concept in Latin American countries. And after this proof of concept, the number of crimes decreased. So if I understand correctly, the way the proof of concept runs is you will work with the police department, analyze existing data, recommend new patrol routes yes. based on this data. And what do they measure? Yeah, what yeah. determines if it's a success or not? Yeah, yeah. There is some ways to measure impact. One of them is to measure number of crimes during the POCs. And the largest way is A-B test. We prepare two areas where the number of crimes are very similar. And we provide our crime navy application to a one of them for the first month. And after one month, we provide crime navy mobilization to others. OK, and the idea is that because the police and patrols are being used more effectively, that's what leads to the decrease in crime. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And after the POC, we can analyze the area where the team patrols and the other area where the team didn't use our mobile application, and then we can compare the effect. That makes a lot of sense. And so what was the result? What sort of a decrease in crime did you see? We found a decrease. This experiment ended last September, so very new result. So what sort of a percentage decrease did you see? It depends on the area, but the number of crimes decreased by 68%. 68% drop? Uh, yes, but there is many reasons, so we cannot divide. Oh, no, no, but that's, that's amazing. 68% reduction is is astounding. Um, but what, what types of crimes are we talking about here? Is it like graffiti type crimes? Is it uh, like pickpocket like, crime? Uh, uh, pickpocket type and this uh, type of theft. Okay. That, that, that's a bigger number than I expected. Um, let's, let's dig into that a bit. Is that a result of increased patrols? It's the same number of patrols going on in these areas, right? Yeah. And this result is very early analysis, so we have to analyze more. <laughs> no, I understand. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to argue math with a theoretical yeah. physicist. Yeah. So there is many effects from that patrol. Maybe some number of crimes move to the area outside. What goes into the AI model? What is the data you're looking at? Crime data changes depending on the police departments, especially in Honduras, the police departments are very, very interested in the homicide. Mm. So we are focusing on homicide data in Honduras. And in Brazil, many police departments are interested in theft type crimes. But, but in terms of like the training data, what type of data do you put into your model? And we use many data, sometimes past crime data, and also land use data, and Sometimes we use satellite image data. So land use data means like whether it's residential or warehouse yes. or... Oh, yes, okay. yes, yes, yeah. How the area is used. For example, houses or the shops and the kind of shops. All kinds of image data we can put into our model. In another interview, you also talked about some other data you were using. Weather data? Uh, yes, weather data, yes. Traffic? Yes, traffic data, yes, we can use. But now our system doesn't include them. But I read in another interview, you mentioned you were actually using Twitter posts? Ah, we tried some years ago, yes. And it helps in some cities. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There Why? Is, yeah. <laughs> you just... uh, uh, there is a paper that shows that Twitter data is effective for crime prediction because we use Twitter data with latitude and longitude. And sometimes Twitter data includes uh, some traffic accident or some events. You know, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to wrap my head around why Twitter data has any predictive power at all. So is it like people are tweeting about the accidents or the crime first, or is it just 
where there's a lot of people tweeting, crime is low. What what's the the uh, influence there? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many kinds of Twitter data is effective. For example, delay of airplane. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why? Why? I, I, don't, I don't see the connection. Ah, um, uh, sometimes this kind of accident uh, changes the uh, density of people. Oh, okay. And the density of people obviously has an effect on oh, crime, yeah, particularly yeah. like the theft crime, yeah, yeah, pickpockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. But the effect is not so big. <laughs> but, but it exists? Yes, yes. Is that robust? Is that true in all countries? Ah, we only tested in the United States, so... Oh, okay. <laughs> Interesting. What's been the public's reaction to this? I mean, I'm sure you get compared to Minority Report all the time. Yeah, all the time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what's been the public reaction to it? We provide services to governments now, but we want to uh, provide also for the general customers. We want to uh, make a safe road using crime prediction technology, and we will start a new proof of concept in Uruguay from next spring. And also, we want to provide our services for travelers. So with AI in general, people are both excited about it and kind of scared of it at the same time. Have you had any reaction from the public about whether this is good or exciting or scary or...? Yeah, some of uh, people are scared about this kind of technology. And when we provide our crime prediction patrol route, some policemen have to move to the very dangerous area. And some of them are feared about this. Uh, this, is, this <laughs> well, is also, I mean, they should yeah, be going we to get, the dangerous. We, we get yeah. this kind of interviews. But I believe that this kind of technology helps to decrease crimes. But isn't there a chance of having this, this kind of negative feedback loop? So for example, you get more patrols in an area. Mm -hmm. So you get more yes, arrests yes. in the area, yeah, yeah, yeah. which leads to higher crime in the area. Yes, yes, which, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. H how do you prevent that from happening? Yeah, that can happen. And now our models doesn't include this development, but this kind of bias is possible. So we have to put some randomness for the patrol route. Oh, that makes sense. So you, in you do introduce some randomness and then you look at the effect of that randomness yes, yes. to double check the yes. accuracy. Yes, yes. And our crime prediction system, Crime Navi, also makes patrol route with the input of the point data. And police departments have to go to this kind of point right. and they can input the point to our crime Navi system and we can make a patrol route. So we don't determine all of the patrol operation. We only support and policemen decide. Well. I, I understand that, but as um, fascinated as I am with the, the technology of AI, we humans are, are deeply flawed. I, I think we want to believe computers too much. And every time AI has been rolled out, uh, so for example, in America, there's, I don't know if it's AI, but computer systems in general that are being used to like set bail mm -hmm. or for advising on sentencing. And human beings love to say, oh, well, the computer did it. Mm -hmm. It's not me. It's the computer's decision. Yeah. And so you can say, well, the police have the final choice, right? But I think the natural human reaction is to trust the computer. Mm. We don't want to replace the human. We want to support because the accuracy is not 100%. This kind of technology can help people's analysis and management, people's planning, but we should not decide total operation. We can make a heat map of crime prediction, and policeman can input the point where he have to go. From this operation, he can put his intuition to the patrols. Okay. So we want to blend the algorithm and the human intuition. So this been amazing developments just in five years. What does the future of this technology look like? If you look five years or 10 years ahead. Yeah, we provide Crime Navi to a local governments and police departments now. But we want to provide crime prediction technology to general users like travelers or expats. And crime prediction technology needs past crime data. But past crime data is not totally open. The case is very limited. 
the error is very limited. So we developed a transfer learning algorithm, very new algorithms. And this enables us to predict future crime in the area where we don't have crime data. Okay, so right now you're focusing on government sales, police department, security services. Yeah. And you, you think the next step a few years from now will be moving more towards travelers yes. and corporate travel programs, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a problem for travelers. They don't have enough knowledge about security when they travel. And also, they cannot call emergency call during the travel. So we want to connect governments and general consumers. Yeah. I think it's amazing that your company was internationally minded from mm -hmm. even before you founded it mm -hmm. because of your experience in Italy. And Do you find that your experience with foreign government sales yes. makes it easier to sell to Japanese governments as well? Japanese market of police departments are very special yeah. and very closed. So <laughs> maybe uh, finding a partner company is more important to enter to Japanese government's market. Uh, yeah, I can yeah, see this that. This is very special. But in Latin American countries, the wall is not so much higher than that of Japan. So we provide our services to Latin American countries. It's not so much uh, difficult. But to enter the Japanese market, it's very tough. <laughs> Let, let's talk a bit about startups in Japan in general. Mm -hmm. Your jump from research to starting a company, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big jump. Mm -hmm. What was the hardest thing you had to learn? Yeah, there was two big difficulties. The first one is to know how to make business using technology. Because I have only background of research, so I don't have enough knowledge. So at first I developed a mobile application by myself and I tested the user's comments. After that, I have to learn how to make a business model. For this, many advisors and mentors helped me a lot. Okay. The mentors and the collaboration is so incredibly important. Yes, very important. So how did you go about finding these mentors and these advisors? I tried many business contests and I got some prizes. And after that, I met many mentors. All right. I mean, that's a great use of pitch contests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So both Japanese government now and Japanese universities are talking about how important it is to take some of the research and the deep tech and turn it into startup businesses. Mm -hmm. How do you think we can encourage more researchers to start startups? Mm. There is two types of researchers, I think. The first type interested in more about research, more than business. I recommend them to collaborate with some professional startup people. And the second type are interested in starting new business. I recommend them to found by themselves with a collaboration with founders. And, and pointing out that they can make a bigger impact. Yes, yes. But many difficulties to find the co-founders for researchers. In Japan, this kind of culture is not matured yet, so... Yeah, it's, it's getting better, I think. Yes, getting better, yes. But yeah, that kind of open collaboration yeah. is still kind of new in Japan. Yeah, 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 yeah. Even the kind of collaboration you were talking about before with working with criminologists in different mm -hmm. departments, <laughs> that's, that's also kind of new. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, Mommy, before we wrap up, I want to ask you what I call my magic wand question. Mm -hmm. And that is, if I gave you a magic wand and I told you you could change one thing about Japan, mm -hmm. anything at all, the education system, the way people think about risk, the way people think about their jobs, anything at all mm -hmm. to make it better for startups in Japan, mm -hmm. what would you change? For myself, I founded my company with my husband, but the full committee member are only me for a very long time. To find members for my company, I have to struggle a lot. So why do you think it was so hard to find people? Were, were people too scared to take a risk or... Was it too complicated to understand or people aren't comfortable with startups yet? What was the challenge? 
I have a research background and I have to learn many, many things to start a business. So I wanted to meet more people who are open to research people. <laughs> Cultural background of researchers and entrepreneurs are very different, yeah. Yeah. but the mind is very similar. So if they can collaborate, many big change and big impact we can make. But increasing but not so much opportunity to meet and collaborate with uh, researchers and entrepreneurs. Do you think it's just a problem of not enough opportunity or do people have the wrong idea about researchers? Yes. Yeah, yeah. There is many gap for the mind. Very similar, but there are big gap. For example, in many cases, the way researchers think is very abstract, but the way entrepreneurs think are very concrete. So communication is sometimes very different, but the mind is very similar and they also take risks and challenges a lot. So to communicate, we have to understand each other. So you would create more chances for researchers and entrepreneurs and people with different backgrounds to meet each other and exchange ideas. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. If I have this kind of opportunity, I can learn more quick and I can learn a lot. Do you think that's changing? Because when I look at this, it just seems like it is improving both in yes. universities. Yes, yes, and yes. So it's, it's going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, listen, Mommy, thank you so much for sitting yeah, down with you. me. Thank you so much. And we're back. I hope you appreciate the effort involved in keeping my Minority Report references to an absolute minimum. It would be easy. It would be kind of fun. But what Singular Perturbations is doing here is something different and something very real. I mean, a 68% reduction in crime is too big to ignore. And yes, that number may come down a bit as Mommy and the team analyze the numbers and isolate the causation from the raw correlations. But right now, this technology is being evaluated by police forces around the world, and it's going to be a game changer. Something this powerful is going to be used, and, and used a lot. And on average, the world will probably be a much safer place because of it. But these tools also have the potential to make life harder on some of us, particularly those who are already disadvantaged. So far, we humans don't really have a healthy relationship with this kind of AI. We tend to praise the AI when it confirms our existing biases and overrule it when it contradicts them. So what's the answer? Well, giving strong authority to low-quality AI will simply reinforce and amplify whatever biases existed in the training data. Disadvantaged groups will become further disadvantaged. However, giving strong authority to high-quality AI could actually help correct those biases. As Mommy pointed out, adding randomization to patrol routes and rigorous analysis of crime data could show that setting aside our biases can lead to more effective policing and safer communities. Or, alternatively, it could show that those biases are completely justified and that we should focus on incremental improvements. In, in the end, though, it's not a technology problem. It's a human problem. Whether AI leads to greater equality and fairness or serves to further amplify our existing biases depends mostly on us being able to question our own beliefs and admit when we're wrong. Now, the past 10,000 years of human history shows that we haven't been very good at that. But maybe AI can help us get better. Maybe AI can help us become better humans. If you want to talk more about crime prediction or AI in general, Mommy and I would love to hear from you. So come by disruptingjapan.com slash show 199 and let's talk about it. And if you enjoy the show, share a link online or just tell people about it. In this age of over-the-top hype, 
you'd be amazed how much power your honest recommendation has. But most of all, thanks for listening. And thank you for letting people interested in Japanese startups know about the show. I'm Tim Romero, and thanks for listening to Disrupting Japan.